Okay. This is the <clears throat> pre-meeting or the briefing, as I like to call it, of the West Jordan City Planning Commission for May 21st, 2024. Uh, all commissioned are, commissioners are present except Hammond Allen and Trish Hatch. Um, we only have two items on the agenda. One is to approve the minutes from our meeting on May 7th. The other one is a public hearing item, terrain west, flat, west bench, plat four. So are there any uh, things to discuss about the minutes? None. Uh, Ray McCandless will give us a briefing of the Terrain West platform application. Is that better? Yes. All right, so this was part of the uh, former Wood Ranch developments now called Terrain. Um, the Planning Commission has already looked at two, uh, plats one through three. Hello, hello, there it is. So we just recorded plat one. Um, there will be many more plats to go in this development. So we're looking at over, when all is said and done, over 3,000 dwelling units for this project. Um, again, this is for plat four. It's located just west of the 111 highway. Um, there's a couple of different parts to it. You can see it here on the, that's outlined in the red. Um, pretty straightforward de uh, development. There's 65 lots, and um, it's like I say, it's it's just another another plat that's coming through. So, okay, thank you. Any questions from commissioners? Seeing none, we will go to Duncan, who has some <clears throat> some marvelous training for us tonight. All right. So Larry wanted me to present a little bit on uh, land use regulation code. And uh, I interpreted that to be uh, a few different things. One is where does that authority come from and where is it in our code? And uh, what are the things that we look at specifically when we go to either read the code or most importantly to draft uh, new code or amend the existing code because it is one of your major functions as a planning commission right is to uh, recommend to the council uh, changes in our city code these land use uh, provisions and uh, in fact it's actually required by state law right the council cannot approve of any land use regulation code provision without first receiving a uh, recommendation from you after you've held a public hearing, right? Uh, so it's that important. But so I passed out a handout. It's like a two and a third page handout. Um, I'll be referring to that. That first section is a piece of code from the Land Use Development Management Act. Um, right at the beginning, right? We call it LUDMA and it's about 30 pages of code something like that and it's all the main laws basically giving cities authority over land use right because effectively this whole land use process um, is what's allowed by state code right uh, cities exist well in part because they're allowed by the state constitution but they mainly cities exist because the state legislature says we exist, we exist, right? Um, and uh, and then the land use law or the land use authority given to the cities that the legislature allows to be created is also a function of the state legislature giving us that authority, right? 
Uh, and that is in 10-9A-101 and a bunch of other sections afterwards. And the very second section in the Land Use Development Management Act is this 102, which is the first page I gave you. And, and basically it says, in a nutshell, cities can do all kinds of uh, things with regards to land use authority. They give, state legislature gives cities pretty sweeping authority. And there are, with, with all the states in the union, every state pretty much follows one or the other of two main rules and what authority they give to cities, whether it's land use or some other kinds of authority. Uh, in Utah, we refer to what we have as the Hutchinson rule. And the Hutchinson rule basically is we have all the authority that the state legislature specifically gave us plus what they did not disallow, right? Because in my view, there's three possible types of, of authority. One is the authority specifically given by the state legislature. Another is what's specific, specifically uh, prohibited by the state legislature. Then there's that middle gray area. What is neither specifically given nor specifically prohibited, right? And with our construct that's both in Ludma here, and it's also a Utah Supreme Court case, Hutchinson, says that we get the gray area. We get the gray area authority. So we have all of what the legislature specifically gave us, plus what they did not specifically exclude. We get that gray area in the middle. There are other states that it's, it's what we call the Dillon rule, where the local governments, the cities only get the authority that the state legislature specifically gave them and they don't they do not get the gray area right but we do so that's good for us kind of a bummer for people that don't have that uh, so this is part of like i said the hutchinson rule is a supreme court case it's also specifically evidenced uh, throughout state law and when it comes to land use it's evidenced by this section Subsection two there gives really sweeping authority, right? It says a municipality may enact all ordinances, this, that, and the other, dealing with the development of land, including this long list of stuff or anything else, right? Basically, if uh, the, the state legislature has reaffirmed that not only do we get that long list of stuff, but pretty much anything else that they haven't specifically prohibited. And then you can see as an example in subsection three, there's some stuff that they're specifically prohibiting. Not much, but a little bit here and there. That has to do with like oil and gas activity. That's all state law. We can't really affect law regarding oil and gas activity. Um, so that's one of those specific prohibitions. Um, so we have the good rule, the Hutchison rule, not the bad, not the not as good rule, the Dillon rule, right? Does that all make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, and as we're talking about, when we use the term land use regulation, we're really talking about three things. I'm focusing just on one of them. The main, the main thing we're talking about when we talk about a land use regulation is we're talking about something in our city code, right? Uh, it could also be engineering guidelines or, or improvement standards, but it's something that you've recommended, the council's approved, it's either in our city code or something that looks like our city code. That's the main type of land use regulation. A change to the zoning map is also a land use regulation and a development agreement and development plan. For the most part, most of those are, um, uh, are land use regulations as well. But what I'm focused on tonight is our code, right? Um, so if you go to the second page, it's another part of the state law. Uh, I think I've referenced it before, but 1098502 is the other part of the state law that instead of it being the scope of what authority we have, this section deals more with how do we do it? What's the procedure of how you guys recommend uh, a city code text amendment, right? Land use regulation amendment. 
And as it says there, you have to look at it first as a planning commission, you hold a public hearing, you review and recommend to the legislative body, which is the council. Um, then the council looks at it. They don't have to hold a public hearing. Like it says, they're just a public meeting under state law. Although by council rules and city code, they have obligated themselves to hold a public hearing. Um, and after they hold their public hearing, then the council either adopts or rejects uh, whatever you recommended. They can ad adopt it as is, they can make a revision and then adopt it. Um, but that's their prerogative at that point. Um, and a lot of times the question comes up, okay, we've got 17 titles in the city code, which ones are land use regulations? And if you can, you can see there, there's a list of the ones uh, it's like a, most of our code is really land use regulations, right? It's 10 out of 17 titles are, uh, are land use regulations. So five, eight through 15 inclusive, and then 17, uh, which means, and what it means if it's a land use regulation, then that means that it has to come to you as a, uh, to consider and have hold a public hearing before it goes to the council, right? as opposed to some other part of the city code that's not a land use regulation that can go straight to the council. Any questions on that uh, procedure of how that works? Okay. And of course, this is the same, not just for a code land use regulation, but also zoning map or development plan slash development agreement, right? It comes here first as well. So the, the main thing I wanted to focus on is just that last little third of a page that's entitled Main Points to Consider in Drafting Land Use Code. Um, because you get these text amendments that come before you, right? And it's kind of helpful to know what is it? Why did it get here? What are we looking at? What's the most important? Um, and I think the first point, as it says there, is ensure that the proposed land use regulations are consistent with state law and with existing land use regulations. Basically, keep it to date, uh, up to date and keep it consistent with itself, right? Um, and, and that's frankly, I don't know, maybe Larry can correct me if I'm wrong, but I bet you at least a third of our um, city code text amendments that come through planning commission, then the council have something to do with complying with state law, especially the most recent changes from their most recent session, right? And it's a fair number, whatever it is. And so that's a lot of times what we're trying to do is make sure, okay, does our, and it's not just how our code's written, but it, does our practice match what state law is telling us we need to do. And so sometimes we may not even have to update our code. Maybe we just need to update how we're doing things, right? In our perfect world, our practices always match our code and our code always matches the state code, right? But everything's in flux, things change, state law changes. And so we're just need to kind of constantly make sure it's, it's up to date. Um, so feel free as, as these text amendments come to you and, you know, we're, we're referencing a change in state law, you know, pull up the state law, take a look at it if you want. Um, and then that second point, ensure that the land use regulations, and, oh yeah, so I kind of covered both of those first two points, right? Make sure everything's consistent. Um, and the third point kind of related, ensure that each chapter is internally consistent. So... And that's usually how we like to do it as a whole article or chapter by itself. Maybe we're looking at the, uh, like we did sometime in the last two years, we looked at the whole conditional use permit chapter, or we look at the, the whole, some other kind of chapter, uh, non-conforming uses or whatever, um, and make sure that the whole chapter is internally consistent, right? Because the last thing we want is to, unintentionally create some ambiguity because we have two different places that uh, might give conflicting information. Um, 
which then ties into that next point to try to avoid ambiguity in general and just make sure the land use regulations say what we think they say, right? Sometimes we, and that's why I think one of the best advantages to a planning commission is, is an extra set of eyes, right? Staff's already looked at it. We think it says what we it's supposed to say. Maybe because we drafted it, we're missing something obvious. Maybe we're missing a different angle or a different way it's going to be applied to an application. Um, and that's, I think, one of your best roles, right? Is to, and you got, and you have as a planning commission sometimes noticed something, right? And even if it's one little word, it's important, right? That we fix it maybe. Um, so, and, and I think one of the best ways to avoid ambiguity and to have better clarity is to have definitions, right? For key terms that we're using all the time. And I probably should have bolded it, but it says there that most of our land use regulation definitions are in section 13-2-3 of our code. Um, and so that's, a, I think, a great place to become familiar with, right? I'm just pulling up the definitions in front of me. Um, we're constantly referring to those. And if there's, that's probably the single most um, amended section in our code. We are just constantly adding, updating different definitions there. Um, even when later on the agenda, we've talked about it, you've got the Wood Ranch or Terrain West Bench development. Uh, it was adopted as a PCH zone. Uh, not only did we create an entire new article of our code uh, so that uh, that made it available for the PCH zone, which they applied for, uh, but we also added quite a few definitions that went along with the PCH zone part of our code. Uh, in fact, one that came up just before we started the meeting, we were talking about uh, open space transfer density or TDOS. And uh, it's right in our definitions in 13-2-3 along with open space. And the open space definition says a lot of what you think it's, you know, an area or a portion of vegetated land for recreation, buffering, whatever, uh, including landscaping, walkways, trailhead, parking, et cetera. Uh, but then open space, comma, transfer density, or TDOS, is it talks about that being a part of a clustered development plan where the density has been permanently transferred and dedicated to the public. And a lot of the TDOS land is not uh, active recreation, right? It's more of the native vegetation kind of thing, but nobody can build houses on it, right? That's the density is allowed in a development in the PCH zone, uh, a certain density of so many units per acre overall, but then you've got this TDOS space that none of the units can go on that area. Uh, but then there's more units in a sense that can go uh, in other areas. And uh, so some of these definitions apply maybe to only one zone. Some apply to all the zones, right? Um, but I think it's a good practice that we've put, for the most part, uh, most of these uh, land use definitions all in one section. So they're easier, easy to find and apply. Um, then another important thing with drafting and land use regulations is just making sure they uni uniformly apply to all the applications that come through. Uh, so as you're seeing, you know, subdivisions, site plans, conditional use permits, you want to be confident and comfortable that you understand uh, our provisions. That's part of the advantage of a staff report is the staff has given you some review of how the uh, relevant land use regulations apply to the given application in front of you, but but you may find something else, right, as you review. Uh, so it is really good to be um, comfortable and confident that you understand the provisions. 
but you might also identify as a planning commission in your with your land use uh, authority hat on as you're looking at these different applications that come in front of you you might find that most of the provisions are working well and accomplishing what they're supposed to and they're being uniformly applied, but you might find a certain provision that maybe doesn't seem to work as well, right? Especially if you've had two times or more that it hasn't worked well, then that might be a possible text amendment, right? You might say, hey, you know, this really doesn't seem to work. Um, maybe we ought to look at changing that. Because sometimes... Um, something looks great on paper until you use it, right? And then maybe not so much afterwards once you apply it. Um, kind of like you play a board game and it doesn't work well until you change the rule, right? Um, it's just it's just what it is. Um, and so that's, I think, another important part of your role. And, and I think a helpful thing too, as you're looking at all these land use regulations is most of the chapters have like a intent and purpose section at the beginning of the chapter, which kind of helps give you some context, right? Here's what this chapter's for. Here's, and it should be in sync too, right? The purpose and intent should match the substantive language that's there. And if it doesn't, maybe that's something we can update. Um, one of the main things I wanted to uh, focus on. And there's a lot of other keywords too, that, that we look at with, uh, with, with code, like city code is the difference between shall and may and shall is the mandatory language, right? And may is the discretionary language. And, and, Typically then in the code, if it's the council doing something, you're probably going to see a may with it, right? Because for the most part, the council exercises discretionary authority. If there's something in the code dealing with you as a acting as a land use authority or the zoning administrator acting as a land use authority, it might say shall, right? Most likely it'll say shall because most applications, if somebody meets the statute, the the criteria in the code, then you have to grant it, right? Um, and so that's typically shall language. Um, and, and a lot of times the shall language comes in when you're looking at using certain criteria. If you remember, even though you've got discretion when it comes to um, recommending land use regulations to the council, like a text amendment or a zoning map or a development plan. Um, there is still, if I remember correctly, I think it's shall language that you shall follow the criteria, right? Doesn't mean you have to either give a positive or negative recommendation. It just means you have to follow those criteria. And I, if you remember with a zone change, I think there's like five criteria, right? And if you find that all five criteria have been met, then you can send a positive recommendation. Uh, if you find that one or more of the criteria have not been met, you can send a negative recommendation. So in essence, that doesn't limit your discretion, right? You can still, uh, on a lot of those go one way or the other, but the shall set is basically, but yeah, you shall go through the criteria, right? Um, so sometimes you have to determine what does the shall apply to, right? It, is, it, is the shall just saying you shall follow the criteria or is the shall that if they meet certain criteria that you have to grant it, right? Um, and usually with an administrative application like a subdivision or site plan, it's you shall grant it if they meet the criteria. If it's recommending the council, it's you just shall follow the criteria, but you've got the discretion to go either way. Um, so those are at least some of the main things in either reviewing or using or applying the city code or how to uh, make recommendations to the council in uh, amending the city code. Any questions? I've got some questions. Yeah. I want to go back to the conversation that we had just briefly before this meeting. Commissioner Hollingsworth asked about definitions. Yeah. Um, 
we probably don't want to get uh, a document with every definition in it, but I, I know I've seen a document that has the zone definitions, like what's an R8, what's an R10. Uh, it might be helpful to all of us, but especially to the newcomers to see what all, what those zoning definitions are if we have a document like that. That's a good idea. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Larry, it sounds like you could put that together. Question number two is uh, re related to uh, page one, mm -hmm. the first uh, letter C there, improve the morals, peace, good order, co comfort, and so on. I recall a meeting many months ago. I don't recall what the topic was or what the application was or who said this, but the, uh, th there was sort of a general impression that the application was for a business that the general community might mm -hmm. consider to be kind of a seedy, shady business. And the mm -hmm. comment was made by somebody that our job is not to uh, determine uh, whether or not to grant an application based on whether or not a, a business uh, we, uh, we think it might be an immoral business. That wasn't our job. But this seems to imply here that it is our job. Right. Now, that's a great question. And the issue becomes how do you exercise that authority? Because certain you have it, right? Um, the, the the thought is that you create you recommend creating the law right <clears throat> recommend the text amendments to the council and then you apply the text amendments once applications come in and this has to be the two step process right because the rest of ludma says that someone is entitled if you go to 109A509 and 509.5, it says someone is entitled to approval of a land use application if they meet all the all the uh, requirements at the time of the application. And so, and this this language here that you're referring to is more. This is what cities can do if they put all of that in place. And so. If we can point, if somebody comes in and there's a, their application seems to have something immoral in nature, and we can point to a specific section in our code that says they don't meet this criteria, then in theory that application could either be denied or they'd have an opportunity to fix it. Um, but we can't just make up an implementing section on the spot, if that makes sense. Um, so having the authority and putting in place the code to be able to enforce it are two different things, if that makes sense. We have to be able to point to something chapter and verse. One example is uh, cities have, and I realize our time's up, uh, one example is sexually oriented businesses, and under state law, we have the authority to, we can't outright prohibit them because of the First Amendment issues, but we can limit the zone and we can limit certain, you know, the uh, limit certain things like that to make it so it's highly unlikely that uh, one could come in. But if we haven't put all of those provisions in our city code, we can't enforce them if somebody comes in with an application. So. Very well, thank you. Um, we'll delegate uh, the role of, of um, identifying sexually explicit uh, issues to Commissioner Thomas. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Field trips are essential. With that, our pre -meet briefing meeting is out of, out of order and closed. And we will, since it's 6 p.m., we will now transition to our regular meeting. This is the Planning Commission meeting for the City of West Jordan, May 21st, 2024. All commissioners are present except Commissioner Trish Hatch. We only have two items on the agenda, the first one being the approval of the minutes from our May 7th meeting, and the second is the application for Terrain West Bench Plat 4. So item number one, minutes. Questions, comments? 
Commissioner Allen. I move that we approve the minutes from May 7th, 2024. Commissioner Gonzalez. I'll go ahead and second that. Thank you. The motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Item number two, public hearing with final action by the Planning Commission for Terrain West Bench Plat number four. Uh, presenting on behalf of third cadence will be Gary Langston. Those on? They working? Okay, good. Um, I'm Gary Langston with Third Cadence and uh, Wood Ranch Development. Getting a little bit of feedback there. And uh, thanks for hearing our item tonight. You guys hearing all that too? All right, I'll talk into one. How about that? <clears throat> so uh, in the spirit of presenting in the, the format that you'd like. I thought I'd go each, through each of the four topics that uh, was suggested by, by Ray. Um, so, uh, Mr. McCandless, I gotta use that. In terms of item A, uh, whether or not the pro proposed plat uh, conforms to and is consistent with the adopted goals and objectives and policies, we certainly believe it does. Uh, obviously, we spent quite a bit of time on the PCH zone and the master development agreement. And we believe the plat is compliant with all of those terms and provisions. And uh, if there is one that is not, we'll certainly make sure that it does. Uh, item B is whether or not the proposed site has adequate, adequate access to public streets. This is plat four, which is a continuation and building upon plats one, two, and three. All of those plats are accessed through, at least at this point in time, two connections to U111, being Terrain Road or approximately 7400 South, and then the second connection would be uh, Chamomile Drive or approximately 7200 South. So we feel like we're adequate there. We provide fire access and uh, at least two connections, if not multiple, uh, depending on where you're trying to get to within the subdivision. Item C, as we move on to public facilities and how we provide uh, access to utilities, water, sewer, storm drain. Uh, it's mentioned in the staff report that uh, water and sewer service are actually provided by Kearns Improvement District for this particular plot, storm drain, roads and whatnot, uh, street lights, all of those are provided by the city of West Jordan. Um, there are a couple of different types of parks and open space within the community. They're, they'll either be maintained by the HOA for those that are labeled as P lots, for the lots that are labeled TDOS, uh, which is transferred development open space, if you're curious, that will be maintained by the city. So I feel like all of those items have been addressed and they're consistent with the MDA and the PCH zone. And then lastly, uh, in order to demonstrate that we're compliant with the, the different details that fall within the zoning parameters, we provided a sub area plan that outlines the different lot types as well as their setbacks as they're referenced in the PCH zone. So with that, I think we meet all of the, the requirements and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this point for us as the development team. Are there any questions for Mr. Mc Mr. Langston? Mr. Allen? I uh, too, and they're both probably really easy. Mr. McCandless reminded us of the enormity of this project uh, in the, the pre-meeting. Uh, how many uh, plats are you looking at doing? And then the second one is this being plat four, how are you doing so far on, on uh, selling lots for the first handful of plats? Uh, or, or where are you in that process? Good question. So, um, the subdivision, uh, we're allowed to have approximately 3,000 units. Uh, if I remember from our business plan, we'll probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 plots if we follow our, our schedule. Could be more or less if, as we adjust along the way, but that's, that's probably what we're shooting for. And then in terms of lot sales and development, we're just about to finish paving plot one and we'll start selling our first lots this week to our home builders who will uh, build our models. And then we expect that lots will become for sale to the public probably in September. So with all of that in mind, we venture a guess that our first homeowner lives in terrain probably 
December, maybe January at the soonest. Wonderful. Second. Okay. So on the uh, the plat uh, the vision plat here, you have uh, a donut hole in there. Is that a going to be a a, a sixth uh, portion of this, or is it just what is the donut hole? So it will be actually plot five that you will see next, okay. uh, probably in a month or so, uh, maybe a little longer. But uh, when you see those types of things, they are generally occurring because we're trying to deliver the plots in a in a sequence that allows us to have inventory to be able to sell to home builders, which would ultimately sell to customers. Um, so if you look at our first three, four, four plots now, first one's 33 lots, the second one's 154, the second or third one's 101, then we get to this one, I think it's 66, if I remember right. Um, plot five that you'll see is back in the hundreds again. And then plot six is a little small one that's 44. And that's all just in an effort to maintain supply uh, as needed for an absorption that generally follows an average of two a month. Thank you. Some are a little slower, some are a little faster, depending on the size. Big lots go slower, small lots go faster. Any other questions for Mr. Langston? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. McCandless, presenting on behalf of the city. Yes, um, it, I don't have a whole lot to add uh, from what Mr. Langston has, has talked about. This is just a 65 lot subdivision, middle of the train development. Um, there's adequate access. The utilities are uh, will be taken care of by Kid, as as was mentioned. Um, we don't have any real concerns or issues with the plant. And our recommendation is for approval, subject to the um, recommendations of a approval that are listed in your staff report. And I'll click over to that slide here. Um, it just <clears throat> all it, this one talks. These are the requirements of approval that staffs recommending. Um, all red line review comments from the city staff are corrected. The um, preliminary subdivision plats valid for a year. Uh, final is is um, uh, is uh, good for two years. It's got to meet all the zoning requirements, and then the. Uh, uh, the sub subdivision plat needs to meet the requirements of the engineering, fire, and utilities department. So, um, with that, I will uh, take any questions that you might have. Commissioner Allen, I have two questions. Could you go back that one slide? Sure. Uh, so, one more immediate, one more perspective. The immediate on uh, requirement approval number three, where Kern's Improvement District is going to be providing some of these services. When we say all city utility plans are approved by the engineering division, public works department, uh, I assume that they are approving their own plans on that side, but they are conveying that approval to the city. Well, uh, with storm brain, for example, that's city. So um, it would, I guess, if you wanted to add a word, it would be all applicable city requirements. Okay. I, I'm looking at city as lowercase. And so I, I guess I'm assuming that that includes their side of it in addition to ours. Well, yeah. I mean, one. Is that okay? okay. Uh, on the more prospective side, uh, and it's, it's been a minute since we talked about the master development agreement and how all this was set up. I remember the it was the north part of this development had the the Kearns uh, aspect water, uh, but we were looking at some water tanks and some other necessities on West Jordan side for the south side of this development. R remind me if I'm going down the right path, and if not. Only back. I think the applicant can answer those questions in more detail, but there is a tank site that's being developed on site. That's not necessary. And, but that will be, um, we're just looking at the plat right now for that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not, obviously it doesn't apply here. I'm just, I'm thinking down the road, if we've got plat five coming in a month or two and then plat six and seven and eight, it's like, okay, at what point does that plat now rely on that tank being constructed? Don't need to know the answer now, but I'd love to know maybe when Plat 5 comes around, just as a prospective, here's kind of what we're looking for. Thanks. Would you, would you like 
Mr. Langston, to answer that. I'm I'm okay waiting unless anybody have I scratched an itch that somebody else wants to. I'd I'd like to hear Gary's answer to that. So for the plats that are imminent, I'll say at least plats one through eleven or twelve will all be serviced for water and sewer by kid. Okay. And the water is immediately available. If you were to look within uh, their exhibits that shows a, a boundary line of what's serviced by KID versus what's by West Jordan City, it's not until we get to phases four and five that we jump into the West Jordan City boundary, um, which that's probably almost a thousand units in before we jump that line. And at the time that that comes online, we're within West Jordan City's uh, zone six boundary for those. And you'll recall that uh, within the terrain development, there's a tank site that's actually uh, feed zone five. My understanding is zone five and zone six are actually interconnected with one another. So um, at the time we actually jump to that area, we'll have to have a conversation with city staff about uh, what, uh, ERUs are available depending on what tanks are constructed um, and so on. But our belief is that by the time uh, we need that water, there are others uh, above or below us who will need it first. Thank you. Other questions for Ray? Okay, this item will notice for public hearing, therefore public hearing is now open. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to address this application? Is there anybody on phone or online? Seeing none, public hearing is now closed. It appears to me that all of the applicable criteria have been met, so would somebody like to make a motion? Guess not. Sorry. I'd be happy to. Oh, okay. uh, Ray, would you forward ahead to that wonderful slide that you always put together because I don't print out the packet in advance? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I move that the Planning Commission approve the preliminary major subdivision plan and preliminary sub area plan for terrain plat for subdivision located on approximately 18.402 acres at 7400 South and SR 111 with the conditions and requirements of approval listed in this report. Mr. Gonzalez. No. I'll yes. go ahead and second that. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. I'll make a motion that we adjourn. We are adjourned. <laughs>